So quite a while ago, I met with L.A. Marzulli, and he started telling me about uh, this Kandahar giant. And and what <laughs> I know about the Kandahar giant is, is very little. It's just what uh, L.A. Marzulli told me. And and he interviewed some of the soldiers that was involved in in this Kandahar giant story. And and so uh, I I don't know anything more than just what he told me. And it was quite a while ago. But I but I did a video here recently. And uh, I mentioned the Kandahar giant because, you know, I, I some people have said they've seen some of these giants that are alive. So I got an email from Ray Rahim here saying that he had some connections with the Kandahar giant with his dad and his grandmother and some stories like that. So with that said, Ray, tell me um, your your family's uh, history and involvement or, or what you know about this Kandahar giant, because I don't know that much, but it sounds like, you know, a little bit more. Uh, of the backstory people know the front story but they don't really know the backstory so tell me what you know and how you came to know this okay um well let me start by saying that my family uh hails from kandahar afghanistan and my father was born in i believe 1936 1937 and he was born to uh my grandmother who was a practicing witch you know, and she was pretty embedded in the, you know, dark arts and black magic, as I understand it. Anyhow, um, when my father was coming of age, you know, as he was growing up, he witnessed my grandmother doing some weird things, um, you know, ritualistically speaking. And uh, that led him to, you know, eventually over the course of his life, realize that my family is actually for some generations has been involved with I don't know if you would consider it catering to or uh, consorting with um, these beings or entities uh, that we all know as these giants. And um, yeah, yeah. So that that's that's pretty much uh, what I've come to know from you know my father when he was alive. And my father's been he he died back in 2013 in March. So he's he's been dead for about 10 years now. So, so you, uh, you was telling me or, or that, uh, you know, your dad seen a footprint and, and he told you about this, but he really never told you about the Kandahar giants or anything like that. Just, just that he told you about the footprint he's seen. And then later on, um, he, he, you, you'd seen a story about the Kandahar giants and then you asked him about that. Yeah. Yeah. So what happened was, um, I was, 18 years old, um, I had just graduated high school and this was in 2005. Um, I'm currently 36, I'll be 37 next month, or I'm sorry, in January, I'll be 37. And um, when I was 18, uh, let, let me just to digress for a moment, I was put in foster care for 10 years. So right after high school, I decided to go live with my biological parents again. And, you know, so, as so, I was living so, with- so, so let me back you up here real quick, okay? Sure. sure. Your family, when when the Russians came into Afghanistan, your your parents fled the fled the country, and you was born in a refugee G camp. But then you ultimately ended up, and you know, tell me that. <clears throat> yeah. So what happened was um, the Russian invasion happened in the eighties, and I was born in eighty seven. And uh, right before I was born, uh, my family fled from Afghanistan. I guess this would have been in 85 or 86. They fled from Afghanistan where the fighting was starting to take place um, to uh, Pakistan, to Karachi. And I was born in a refugee camp on January 23rd, 1987 in Karachi. And then my family used that as a jump off point to come to America because my, I believe my mother's side of the family hailed from Karachi. And um, that that's pretty much uh, how my family came to America is uh, because the Russian invasion and my father was a tailor master. He made clothes and traveled from country to country. He wasn't exactly a fighter. I mean, he was a Pelwan, you know, like what they know as strong men over there. You know, he could do feats of strength, but he was no soldier. He was a militia. <laughs> that was my yeah. uncle's. Um, yeah. So 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 you you you. You end up in the United States. You 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 end up living in a foster home. Yeah. Um, um, so I was in foster care from the age of eight 
Uh, I was placed in um, in Berks County, Pennsylvania. That's you know the Reading area. I was placed in a foster home with a pastor and his wife in Warminster, Pennsylvania, and I resided there with that pastor and wife um, in Warminster, Pennsylvania, for ten years. And when I was eighteen years old, um, at the time. I decided that it was time for me to go reconnect with my real family. So I went to go live with my real parents, my biological uh, parents, who are now very elderly uh, in Reading, Pennsylvania. And this was in the summer of 2005. Um, so as I was getting to be reacquainted with my family and my culture and distant relatives and friends of the family, I started to slowly gather that um, my family history was anything but normal and i wouldn't have known this because i was i was you know i was away since i was a very small child so uh this was all kind of a culture shock and i thought some of it was like some hoo-ha some superstition old wives tales you know what have you but um later i would find out some things um that kind of you know i was able to connect all the dots from like what my family and friends of family had told me and realized that you know, perhaps my family was involved in something pretty serious, uh, pretty dark, and possibly very, uh, I don't know, like mystical or whatever, but um, it, it was certainly starting to get my attention, and it certainly really fascinated me when, I guess it would have been in 2010, 11, or 12, something like that, I was on YouTube, and I saw this story that someone had about the Kandahar giant. I'm like, okay, well, I'm from Kandahar. What is this? You know, it sounds like something my father told me. <laughs> so back in 2005, when I graduated from high school and started living with my family, some of these stories I was hearing were about all of the black magic that happened in Afghanistan, all of like the superstitious, spooky stuff that happened during the uh, Afghan-Russian war. And then my dad told me that he... You know, when I asked them, like, hey, have you seen like any really crazy things when you were like off being young and dumb in the mountains of Afghanistan? He's like, in fact, a few times. Yeah. And my mother warned me to stay away from like these these caves, uh, not just because they're inhospitable to humans, you know, because you go in there, you can die or slip or something, but because of what lived in them. And she never elaborated until one day after like a heavy rain, you know, he was out camping in the mountains, you know, just being a hooligan, because that's what my dad was. And um, he basically came across this footprint that he claimed was as long as he was tall. And he didn't know what the heck it was. And he's, he's, it, he's it, telling it, you, he's telling you this and he's saying it is, it's a, it's a human looking footprint. He's saying, he he said he said it looked like his footprint because it was muddy out and you know he didn't you know I mean he had like shoes uh, you know yeah. like those sandal sandal type things you know but um he he said like it was pretty uncanny the shape the contours of everything it was it was a human foot and he just looked and he was just dumbfounded like you know is this a prank did someone you know is is someone messing with me I mean what is this and it wasn't just one it was like. And they were like wide apart, you know, like it was like he saw another one like 10 feet away. He's like, what the hell is this? You know, so he asked his mother about it. And she's like, remember when I told you to stay out of those caves? And he was like, oh, and, uh, you know, he didn't go in those caves. I'll tell you what. So. So uh, when when he told me that in 2005 and then. Five to seven years later. You know, I, I forget what it was. It was easily over 10 years ago now. But when when I was on YouTube, just, you know, going down these weird conspiracy type rabbit holes and disclaimer to everyone, I've always been that guy. People have always accused me of being that guy. So if I sound nuts, it's nothing new. I've heard it all. <laughs> but um, it, it really kind of fascinated me when I heard this on YouTube. So then I went and asked my father about it. And he said, well, yeah, like it just so happens that when I was young, my mother, I used to go with her and she used to tie one of our goats or sheep or whatever they had available to a post right outside of this one specific like cave or cabin entrance like by their village. And he didn't really know what it was, but you know, l later, you know, you know, he 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 
was like, well, I never told you this because you never asked. But yeah, I, I, you know, that footprint that I saw and she told me to stay out of the cave and all that. Yeah, there was something living in there. She's like, I don't know what she knew what, but, you know, she she said it was something that um, has been around a very, very long time. And if we don't want it to come and get us, we just have to give it these offerings. And there were people apparently that there was like cults that formed behind the worship of these things or this thing, you know, and apparently it was this, I, I, I would assume this giant, you know, and my dad said, yeah, yeah, like that. And I told him the story that I had heard on YouTube and, you know, my dad is a hooligan. He's a little bit of a dark guy and he just started laughing and he's like, thank God my mom told me to stay out of those caves. So, so, you know, you, you, you his mom, your grandmother was a yeah. practicing witch voodoo yeah. magic type thing yeah. Um, yeah. i imagine she wasn't the only one there was probably others so yeah. so yeah. um there was a story um that i heard and i don't know how true it is that that, that there was an elderly woman or a, some of the townspeople would come up and bring food to this this giant yeah. um yeah. do you hear anything about that from your dad i mean you're saying that your grandmother used to take a goat up there is she yeah this woman that used to take food to this or is she part of a group that used to take food or or do you speculate that or you really don't know or i mean i i have thought about it certainly you know just from all of the other digging around i've done talking to other you know people you know not related to my family but you know they're from the same area as my family and their parents knew my parents so it's like the kids knew each other you know and we've talked and they're like, yeah, like, you know, practicing black magic and consorting with jinns, you know, like these genies or these spirits, you know, these uh, these beings made from fire, you know, as their Quran talks about. Um, they're, they're apparently real. And a lot of people know how to get in touch with them. And some of them straddle the line between the supernatural and the physical world. And they can appear to you whenever they feel like. And, you know, much later, I would realize, OK, Bigfoot might be the same kind of being. You know, it's like one second they're there, one second they're not. I mean, 800,000 pound gorilla person, how do you miss them? You know, that's it's kind of weird, right? So, um, yeah, yeah, it's it's uh, so you're saying the gin is kind of like these giants. I, I, well, my father told me that his mother would go up there, tie an animal to you know, a rock or you know, um the nearest tree or whatever near where this thing was. And, you know, they'd hear this, you know, they'd be going down the mountain and all of a sudden they'd hear like this screaming and stuff of the animal behind them. And they knew that the thing was accepted, you know? Um, and she said that, yeah, as long as you keep on basically like using, I guess, sigil magic. Cause she had a sigil tattooed on her forehead in Arabic. And it was like some type of like spell, I guess, to protect her. I don't know if it was from those things or other things or whatnot. Um, but she believed that these things were not fully physical and that they were like these. Uh, I don't want to say like demons, but they were just these other forms of, you know, creations that lived on a different spectrum of reality or a different dimension, something like that. Yeah. So you said something interesting. You said uh a, a fire, a black fire. You said what? What did you call say? Yeah, uh, jinns. Um, they're they're spirit beings, and they're made from fire. And I know there's something. There's a video you had made about the black fire nephilim, or the yeah, some, yes. something I'm like just that. Thinking Salvador that Del made Gavio, me think as well. At, yeah. at night, he's seen these shadowy these guys yeah. that it's yeah. dark, but he, it's like they have these black fire things. You know. Yes. It was, yes. It was that, that's fire, another thing. Black. You know. So is that that's a very that real thing? The, is that the same kind of a thing then? Huh? Yes. So, yes. So that that they, is a that is a thing in Afghanistan. Is these shadow beings that? Yeah, that's exactly what those black fire nephilim. I guarantee you, they're the same thing. Um, and they're they're like a well known thing in Afghanistan. In fact, really? they terrorize people during the day sometimes. They do it in Africa sometimes. There's like a whole village that had to sleep together on the floor in Africa because someone in the in the village was doing like black magic. They actually found like animal bones and like I don't know how they determined it was semen, but they found semen and they found like blood and they found it like I don't know if it was in a jar or a container or something, but they found it 
and they realized that whoever was doing that in the village, it was causing this like golem spirit to come and terrorize people so much that they all had to sleep together at night. <laughs> Scary uh, stuff. Yeah. So, 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 you know, your, your grandmother was, was into the dark magic, you say, you know, was any of yeah. her, what was this passed down from her? mother or grandmother or was there several yes. generations and and i guess what i'm getting at was was yeah. these giants were was your family maybe leaving offerings or taking goats up you know for yep. many generations yep yep I, I believe that's exactly what happened because my dad uh told me that he asked his mother like well you know that that's like that's kind of foul and weird like why why are you doing that and he he wasn't really like yeah, I guess I guess he was kind of, you know, my, my grandmother was, you know, a black magic witch. So I don't think he wanted to piss her off, but he didn't really exactly want to help her out with it. But um, pretty much he had asked her, like, hey, how long has this been going on? And she's like, well, my grandmother is the one who taught me and her grandmother taught her. And it was like, it's only a thing with the women for some reason. I don't know why. You know, and I I know that my grandmother's father was the village exorcist you know so i believe his mother was the one that taught her you know yeah okay so you was also telling me that that uh, your father told you that there was more than one yeah yeah apparently uh you know she wasn't the only one doing this you know, there were, I don't know, I, I'm assuming there were just like different people around different areas and these things, they moved through the caves and there had to be more than one if, you know, more than one person was like doing that, you know, but I don't think it was too many. I, I wouldn't assume that because if, if enough people got wind of that, I'm sure, you know, they marched up there with pitchforks and staffs themselves, you know. So it was like kind of a well-kept secret for the most part. You no, know, it's like if you went up there and found out, you you know you yeah, messed around and back, found right? out. Yeah, you messed around and found out is what happened. So, yeah. So so you don't do you know how often they would take a goat up there? I mean, was it once a week, every other day, every day? And and how did they come up with all these goats? Did they have a goat, goat herd specifically just to feed these things? And and was there a community thing that helped them uh, get these goats to appease these giants? Or do you know of any yeah. of that? Was, I, I don't, any of that asked? Yeah, yeah, I, I did ask my dad about that. Because, I mean, I was just like, you know, I, I was just super curious at this point. And I was like, well, you know, you guys weren't exactly rich. How'd you afford to feed them? He's like, we didn't feed them we only like gave them enough so that they didn't want to come at. We just wanted to make nice and we wanted to keep making nice, like kind of like, you know, the local mob boss, you know, you got to hit them off with a little bit of your profits if you don't want them to come around and rough you up, you know, kind of thing. And, you know, it was kind of like that. And that's the vibe I got from it. You know, and my dad said, yeah, like apparently this was not a thing you wanted to like upset. So, so um, do you think the, the townspeople did know about it or didn't know about it and they was helped pitching in and they gave it to the local witch, her job to take care of it? Or I would argue that the people who dabbled in black magic knew about it and the other ones speculated, you know, and if they really wanted to go find out, they probably just didn't come back, you know. That that would be my guess. I mean, if like like I said, you know, something like that, it's... I mean, it doesn't say stay a secret for long. If suddenly you find out there's like a 10, 12 foot cannibalistic person living in a cave, you know, <laughs> that's scary. You know, you have dudes in, you know, I've watched documentaries. I've never been locked up myself, thank God. Uh, but I've watched documentaries of, you know, people in prison who go after the big, tough, scary, intimidating prisoner just because they're scared of them, not because he's like trying to do anything to that person, you know, sometimes fear preemptively makes people go to violence, you know, and I can't imagine if you found out there was a monster living in a cave up the hill, you wouldn't do something about it. Kind of like Beauty and the Beast, you know, everyone's kill the beast, you know. Yeah, so, so, um, so when you found out about the Kandahar giant, you 
you know, your family, you got, still have relatives in Kandahar. You had relatives. Yep. I imagine you was really, really interested. Um, did you research that, study that at all? Did you, you know, what what did you research? What did you think? Did you reach out to any anybody, any other relatives about this? Did it pique your interest? Was you interested? It did. It did. Um, I asked my uncle about it. And I, I, I want to say he's still alive. I mean, I haven't seen him in years. Uh, he lives in Pakistan. I asked him about it and he said he didn't know anything about it. I asked my sisters before, again, they think I'm a conspiracy person. I mean, the only one that I really spoke to about it was my father. And I spoke to uh, one of the other Afghan people in the community, but he didn't substantiate anything about giants. He in fact told me everything else that apparently his father saw in the uh, Afghan Russian war you know, regarding demons and spirits and angels and just, he, he has some stories, you know, what they tell you you've seen. Well, um, he basically was like a, uh, like the Afghani, like, I don't want to say wannabe version because he was it, you know, he did like do what he had to do to, you know, do his part. But, you know, he said that he basically saw some very unexplainable things, you know, um, they captured some guys, you know, some Russian guys before, and, you know, these Russian guys were screaming like, Hey, wait a minute. I thought there was like 20,000 of you down here on the ground. What is this? You know, he was like a helicopter pilot or something, you know, and his, his craft like ran out of gas or something. They didn't, they didn't like end up being the reason he like was on the ground. But they did like capture him and they held him and they were interrogating him. And he's like, yo, when we were up in the sky, we saw there's like 20,000 of you down here. And they're like, no, our God's that strong. 300 of us look like 20,000 to you, hmm. you know, stuff like that. You know, it's like apparently, you know, they had like angels with them, you know, protecting them. And, you know, that's they believe that's how they won that war uh -huh. was through all of these supernatural means. Um, you know, these Russian shells, some of them are like this big coming from these helicopters, you know, um, and they would be halfway embedded in the the homes in Afghanistan and they would use them as coat hooks on the inside. Huh. And it was just a very common thing. And, you know, you have like geckos and stuff running up the walls, you know, just chilling on the tips of these bullets. <laughs> They'd end up in your clothes. You know, they, they, they said that sometimes these shells for no reason. They'd be sitting there eating. These shells would just get pulled out and start levitating on the other side of the house and then just drop. Huh. Weird stuff. Really weird stuff. Um, they said the stuff about the shadow people, you know, when there was a lot of fighting and there was an area where a lot of these, like, uh, I, I guess you would call them jihadis, you know, they believed they were fighting a holy war and they died doing it they would haunt that little section of land that was like their cemetery, their graveyard. And there's such an unsettled spirit that anyone who goes over there is going to get assaulted really bad by them. In fact, I saw that there was a story on a Netflix show called haunted where there was an Afghan, there was, there was an American soldier stationed at a certain place in Afghanistan. And that like little watchtower that he was stationed at, he apparently started getting harassed by like a spirit, by one of these jinns or demons, you know, these these beings made from fire. And it followed him all the way to the U.S. and all the way back when he did a second tour of duty. Yeah, it, it's just all all kinds of stuff like that. It's like based on what my cousin tells me. And then I see something like that on Netflix. I'm like, whoa, hold on a second. This stuff has to be real. These people can't be just taking me for a ride, you know. So. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, so, fascinating stuff. So I got to ask you, so, so you, you, you're, you're just, you're a newborn, you come to the United States, you're put in a foster care system with a, with a, with a preacher's family. And then later yep. on, you, you go and live with your parents and you find out that your, your grandmother was a witch. Was your, was your dad a, like a warlock or was your, you know, what, what was no. your thoughts of that? And what was your dad's thoughts? Well, well, my my father was, you know, he 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 was a Muslim. He didn't believe any of that stuff, but I I guess he was kind of numb to it. He he knew about it, and he didn't he like grew up with it. I condemn. Guess. Yeah, yeah, he didn't condemn it, but he didn't endorse it either. He didn't push it on anyone. 
but I was very shocked that he, he knew practice about it. it? Because he never, no, no, didn't practice it. He didn't, didn't really to practice. It. it seemed or, like he was very like, or was it just I, to the, I, you for know, the women? Or was it just for the women? <laughs> could be, could be. Yeah, it was but, his sisters. I mean, did his sisters practice it? No, no, and and I believe that it was yeah, just just on the woman's side of the family because my sister, who is alive today, claims to be a psychic medium and that she, you know, dabbles in the you know, the, the arts, but she thinks they're the the like a white witch, like the white arts, you know, not the dark arts. Um, and so you got the white witches it's, and the dark witches. Yeah, yeah, but uh, apparently. I believe a lot of my family has a predisposition to naturally be sucked in and drawn to this kind of stuff, you know, whether it be through dreams or through actual like hearing voices. I mean, for the longest time, you know, we, we thought, you know, my mother was schizophrenic, but it might be that she was just, you know, my grandmother didn't like her. Ah, I'll put it that way. I think you know, and first her, huh? I 1000% believe my mother was cursed by my grandmother. Now there was already a little bit of mental illness going on there because it ran in my mother's side of the family. But I think it was like the proverbial nudge off the edge of a cliff. And it could be, it, it, I wouldn't put it past my grandmother from what I've heard about her. Yeah, so you was, very, you tell, very scary woman. Yeah. You was telling me about some other things that your grandmother that uh, her husband, she didn't like, they didn't end up living yep. very long or, Yep. Yep. Apparently, a few of her husbands turned up poisoned, um, and uh, you know, people. You know, especially in those days. You know, you're talking. Uh, I don't know, early 1900s. You know, something like that. Maybe you know, 1920s. There's no cell phones, no cameras, no evidence. There's there's nothing. You know, you could very easily. You know pull some boardwalk empire stuff and get away with it, you know, <laughs> let's put it that way. Um, and she had a reputation for the black magic, always having a new husband and the previous one ended up dead and, you know, always missing a goat. So, <laughs> yeah. So, so, so did your, your, how did you find out about this? Did your dad tell you this and, and what did he think uh, of, his, of his mother? And yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I had some pretty interesting conversations with my dad that I don't think any of my other siblings did because I was the one who lived with them uh, in their last years. And, you know, I helped take care of them and stuff, you know, until their death. But um, he basically told me, yeah, he was scared of his mother. He was deathly scared of his mother, you know, and a lot of people like my oldest sister, she was scared of my grandmother. Um, my mother was scared of my grandmother everybody was very deathly afraid of that woman hmm. um yeah so i i think there was a tremendous amount of trauma my father went through didn't talk about it you know very old school macho you know type and that that's cool you know that was just a cultural thing but um if there was a problem i don't think he knew it was there <laughs> you know he's the type to just kind of buried under the rug and you know, yeah, he said he loved do? his I mother, mean, you're, but you're, you're living there and, and, you know, and, and she's taking care of you and it's your mother. And what do you do? That's yep. all, you know? Yep. Yep. That's all he knew. Yep. Yeah. So that's, uh, that, that's, that's pretty much, um, the tale of that with my grandmother and, uh, you know, rest in peace, you know, hope she has peace now, but certainly didn't when she was alive, unfortunately. You know, I, I, my, my real curious is, is this Kandahar giant, you know, and, and, and your grandmother taking goats to, and your dad seeing the footprint. Is there anything else that you think of that, uh, that shed more light onto that or? Um, well, I can say that when, when, when my dad was telling me all this stuff in 2005, he basically told me that the FBI had come to see him right after 9-11. And apparently they did this to a lot of people and, you know, from Afghanistan, you know, they wanted to yeah. see if they were uh, a terrorist or something, right. you know, I guess, you know, all right, that's fine. You know, 
And he said he was visited. I don't know if it was by the FBI or Homeland Security or who, but he told me he was working at his convenience store in uh, at 8th and Walnut in Reading. And this would have been in the early 2000s, right after 9-11. And some people out there might have known my father. His name was Abdul Rahim. Um, if anyone from the Reading area is listening to this, yes, 8th and Walnut, the Getty, the fried chicken spot, that was my dad. And he basically told me that when they came and asked him about if he's a this and that, and if he has any ties to any organizations over there, he thought they were going to bring up that giant. Really? Yeah, yeah. He thought that was one of the things they were going to bring up. And he was kind of like shaking in his boots a little bit because he he told me he didn't know what he was able to tell them. Like he he probably would have pointed them to the direction of where it lived, but that's as far as he would have gone. So if they if the I guess if the U.S. government had prior knowledge of it, so I mean what, they didn't they didn't know my dad knew about it. So what did he say? Why he thought that they knew about it would be interested in it back then? No, just that you know now suddenly there's fighting there and the U.S. is there and now government affiliates are here questioning him about where he grew up and stuff. You know so. He was just waiting for it. Like, all right, I I know they're going to ask me about like this thing that my mother used to do here. No, nope, they never did. And then, you know, I guess this would be a couple years, you know, no, I guess this would have been around the time. I don't know. If, I don't know when that uh, kind of hard giant thing happened. Was I, it 2003? Something I don't, like that? I don't know either. I have, I have yeah. like I say, I do not know that much about it. Just I know L.A. Marzulli just told me a little bit of. You know, he yeah. told me a little bit of the story, but I, I, you know, I, I never paid real good attention. I mean, it was interesting yeah. to me, but yeah, it, it was definitely pre two thousand three that my dad was visited by these uh, people because nine eleven happened, and then they were going around, and so it was obviously like a year after that. So they probably interrogated my dad before this giant incident even occurred, and. You know, when he told me that, I connected that in my brain too. I'm like, wait a minute, if if we if we went in there after 9/11 and this thing happened then, and they came and talked to you, like right after it happened, that probably didn't happen yet. You know, so that thing might have still been alive. That one anyway. So so, like I said, I I don't know that much about it. So you probably studied it real real hard, being so you know, your family is so. So tell us, for those that don't know about the Kandahar, the Kandahar giant, tell us a little bit about <clears throat> what you know, what happened, what down, what went down. Um, just from what I saw, like, you know, in these YouTube videos and, you know, whatnot, apparently, you know, I don't know if it was special forces or just like Marine recon or Navy SEALs. I have no idea. But apparently these special forces guys went missing. And they didn't know what the hell happened to them. So then another team came and they found them. And that's when they encountered this, this gigantic thing that was like something out of like a horror movie that apparently moved with a lot of speed, manhandled them like they were toys, and basically gave them a really good run for their money. And apparently they were told to aim upwards when they like came to that area and they weren't told why. So well, that's, I I don't I don't really know you know like I say just remember what L A said and and that's been a while ago and so I don't remember everything and might not even be yeah. exactly right but seems like yeah. they found the first group and they were all dead possibly something like that remember. yeah and, and then they were shooting at it and nothing was happening so somebody said you know aim for the face shoot for the face or or something like that I could be wrong but yeah yeah I only know. You know, th their incident, I only know based on what I heard, you know, in these yeah, YouTube yeah. videos. And even back then, I actually commented on that YouTube video. I don't know if it's still around, but I commented on that, you know, and I said the same thing that I said to you in this video uh, or in your last video uh, regarding uh, Robert Shrewsbury, you know? Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, that that's probably at this point, everyone probably knows as much as I do, you know, about the whole incident um i don't know if there's other i don't know if there's other old time afghan people that were involved in that as well i mean i imagine if 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 they're in the u.s they're 
maybe not going to talk about it. Maybe they will. I mean, maybe if the wrong person sees this interview, <laughs> they might be like, hey, you know, why are you talking about this stuff? But I don't care. I mean, you know, people need to know, you know, I mean, these people had families and stuff, right? There's people that died supposedly from the, from the giant of Kandahar. Yeah. You know, maybe this will help shed some light and give some closure. So d did your dad or say anything that, that villagers did end up missing? I guess they did because your, your mother yeah. told him not to go in the caves. Yeah. His, his oh yeah. Yeah. Not to go in the yeah. cave. So I guess they knew that, you know, so, yeah. and, and so everything you're saying, you know, is secondhand that you got, but it was interesting to you because it come from where your family was from. And, yep. and when you found out your mother, your grandmother was feeding these and, and it was interesting to you. And, and so who knows really a hundred percent what happened because your grandmother and your dad's not alive anymore to get more stories from it. But, you know, you tried to piece it together the best you could, man. I, I appreciate you sharing it with us, Ray. And, and have you got anything else or that's about it? Well, um, I, I can say that, you know, the people of Afghanistan are, they're, they're used to like, you know, a very, very tumultuous type of environment, you know, um, I guess from time immemorial, you know, everyone's been traveling through there, you know, based on like Silk Road activity or, you know, certain like conquerors you know i guess it was conquered at one point by genghis khan right but um i mean they're they're great people overall uh, very misunderstood very uh i think they have a very very bad rap uh based on you know all the fighting that went over there especially in the last couple decades but you know if you go on youtube and you see uh people traveling over there they're relatively cool you know I, I think anyone who uh, meets an Afghani person, you know, they'll see that, you know, we're like everyone else, <laughs> you I think, know, for I the most part. I think that's what everybody is a whole, you know, the people are generally great people. And then you got some bad eggs in, in, yeah. in yeah. all cultures, all religions, all yeah. all races, all that, that put a bad name on everybody for the rest. Oh, of yeah, sure. Of it, all, sure. Of us, all of us just want to want to want to have peace and get along. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, and and I can honestly say that uh, it, it's it, it's a very very niche thing um, that a lot of the people who know about this like actually you know can substantiate anything uh, with it because otherwise someone's going to look at you like you know what are you talking about you know what, what is that I, I never heard of the giant but I think a lot of people who dabble in dark magic and a lot of people that lived in these really old villages, these rural villages, I think maybe they still had some contact with these beings, you know, and maybe they were comfortable enough still to like consort with a certain family bloodline, you know, like, okay, I trust you. Oh, you're that person's grandma. All right. I trust you. You know, and I think that's how it kind of went uh, over time um, yeah. until one day, they just never took that goat and either they moved on or they died or, you know, something. You're saying but the giant eventually... never took the goat. Yeah. Yeah. One day my dad said that, you know, after so many times and he was still young at this point, um, my mother, his mother was complaining that, you know, this goat wasn't being taken and she had to keep going up and feeding it to keep it alive. And eventually so much time went by when she's like, okay, I guess he doesn't want it or it's, he's not around and never did it again. You know, that was that. Yeah. So, so if anybody um, knows more about this Kandahar giant, if they're from Kandahar and they have any stories, if they knew your grandmother, Ray, or they knew your family's history, you probably would like to know more about it. Even, you know, even though I it's the dark side, you still, it's still a history. It's not nothing you really want to be involved with, but you still want to know the history and especially about these giants. Let us know. Leave a yep. comment. And if you got any questions for Ray, I'm sure Ray, man, if you leave a comment and you'll answer them, Ray. Yeah, absolutely. And with that said, I appreciate you, Ray, and that's a wrap. Awesome. Thank you, Terry. I appreciate it. Uh, I love your channel. I've been following you for a long time. And uh, yeah, thank you. I really appreciate it. Ray, man, thank you. Thank you.